blessed Sunday morning to each and every one of you from the Florence International Church in Florence, Italy. I'm Pastor Randy McGee, and it is my wonderful privilege and pleasure today to be able to share the Word of God with you. We hope today that you will allow the presence of the Holy Spirit to speak to your life in a very special and very momentous way. Jesus is real today, and Jesus is alive. We are going to enter into our message here in just a few moments, but before we do, we want to take time just to allow our spirits to focus and to spend a few moments in worship unto the Lord. So join us now as we sing and worship the Lord together as we prepare today to receive the Word of God. When the sun comes up, satisfy us before the day has passed us by. Before our hearts forget. Sing great. 
Continuing our series today, and in fact, this will be our final message that we will be sharing regarding the life of David and the fact that he was a man after God's own heart. And we hope today that this will be an inspiration to you. From 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verses 26 through 30, we read the following passage of Scripture. David, son of Jesse, was king over all Israel. He ruled over Israel 40 years, seven in Hebron and 33 in Jerusalem. He died at a good old age, having enjoyed long life, wealth, and honor. His son, Solomon succeeded him as king. As for the events of King David's reign from beginning to end, they are written in the records of Samuel the seer, the re records of Nathan the prophet, and the records of Godeth seer, together with the details of his reign and power and the circumstances that surrounded him and Israel and the kingdoms of all the other lands. Today I want to speak to you about endings, good endings, dignified endings, and in fact that is the position that we will be looking at today as we look into this passage of Scripture David's dignified ending. We've been studying the life of David now for some weeks, and we have watched as the boy became first a man, and we have watched as the shepherd became a king. We have followed David across the high mountain peaks of success and even into the valleys of defeat. We have seen him when he gleamed with the glory of righteousness, and we have also seen that glory tarnished by devastating sin. We have watched David as he enjoyed the blessings of his God, and we have watched him as he endured the consequences of his sins. His life has challenged us because there are so many parallels that we can find between his experience and our very own experience in the day in which we now live. In this text, we find David at the end of his trail as far as this mortal life is concerned. He is 70 years old now. He has reigned as king for 40 years. He is about to pass the torch to the next generation. 
But before he does this, David has some last words for those who have gathered around him in chapter 28 and verse 1. In these last words of David, we can see what occupied his thoughts as he reached the end of his life. And in this last word, we can find and read about a dignified ending to a life that was pleasing over all unto the Lord. Let's examine these last words, these last words of this old king, and in them we will encounter some characteristics that should mark the end of our own lives as well today. I want to share with you some thoughts about a dignified ending. The first sermon point that I will bring out today comes from chapter 28, verses 2 through 8, and it is that it was a time of reflection. David lets us know that the last days of his life were filled with thoughts of a dream that he had never saw fulfilled. David had wanted to build a temple, a temple for the Lord. But God had said no to David's dream, telling him instead that David's son, the next king, would build the temple, as stated in 1 Samuel chapter 7. This had been a disappointment to David. He wanted desperately to build this temple, and now he had been told no by the Lord of whom he loved and served. Evidently, it was a time of lingering disappointment from that day until his death. But David did not allow the Lord's no to derail his life. David gathered the necessary materials to build the temple so that Solomon would have what he needed in the time that was to come. In David's words, we see a man who died with an unfulfilled dream still in his heart. But David did not look back on what God had not allowed him to do in anger. He instead looked back on what God had allowed him to do. He tells us that God had chosen him first to be king. God had picked David, the youngest son of an unknown family, to be king over his people, Israel. God had blessed him, blessed him greatly, promising to establish his kingdom forever in verses 5 through 7. David rejoices that God has chosen his son Solomon for a special relationship in verse 6. And instead of focusing on what God had not done in his life, David chose to reflect back on what God had done in his life. And in doing so, he displays an attitude that we today all should have, especially when the end of life draws near as it does for each of us. If we are not careful, we will come to the end of the way bitter, disappointed, and disillusioned because we did not get to see the fulfillment of our dreams. As we age, it becomes clearer with each passing year that some of our dreams are not going to come to pass. What do we do with those shattered dreams that we all experience? We can become bitter because God said no to our dreams or we can look back with joy, 
thankful for the things that he did bring into our lives in a very special and meaningful way. I suppose that it all boils down to who we believe had the best plan for our life. We can sit around and we can complain about what we did not get or we can choose to rejoice over what God did do in our lives. We can blame him for what we think we missed out on, or we can rejoice in what he brought into our lives. It comes down to a matter of sovereignty. Who is God in our lives? Us or him? If we are the masters of our own destiny, then don't blame God for unfulfilled dreams. Blame yourself. If God is the Lord of your life, then thank Him for what He is doing and He has done because He has brought into your life the things that were best for you and who you were, what He created you to be. So what kind of shattered dreams might you be looking at in this moment today? Maybe you wanted more from your marriage. Maybe you wanted your children to accomplish certain things that you had dreamed for them to do. Maybe you wanted to achieve certain goals along the way of your life. Maybe you are disappointed in your financial success. Maybe you wanted to succeed in some kind of ministry for the Lord. Maybe you had big plans. Maybe you had big goals for life, but none of them seemingly have been achieved. And now you realize that those things will never be accomplished. What does that do to you today as you think about that? How does that make you feel in this moment? Are you content with where the Lord has brought you in life? Or are you bitter that things have not turned out like you planned them to do? The best thing to do with the past and its broken dreams is to let it go. Thank God for where he has brought you and what he has done in and through your life. Learn the lesson of contentment that Paul talked about in Philippians chapter 4. I am sure that he never dreamed he would die like he did, but we find he was content to allow the Lord to have his way. I ask you today, do you experience that kind of contentment in your life? The second point that I will bring out today is from chapter 28, verse 9 through 29. It was a time of responsibility. Oh, I know that that word strikes fear in the hearts of so many. Responsibility is not something that often we look at with a cherished sense of victory. We don't, because it oftentimes means that we are accountable for things that we would rather not be. David, David now speaks to Solomon. And he realizes that the young man standing before him is about to shoulder an awesome responsibility. He is untried. He is untested. But he is about to become the king of Israel. He is about to take the reins of the nation 
And David knows that he needs a few words of instruction. So David speaks to Solomon on two different levels. His relationship to God was first. He challenges Solomon to know God, to serve God, and to seek God. David knows that if Solomon is to be the kind of king he needs to be, to be then he is going to have to develop an intimate relationship with God. He is cautioned to keep his heart and to keep his thought life pure before the Lord. David wants Solomon to be a saved man, a serving man, a seeking man, and a sold out man of God. David is speaking these words from experience in his own very life. David knew the blessings of walking with God, and he knew about the pain of turning away from God. Therefore, he challenges Solomon to stay close and to stay clean. These are the kind of traits every godly parent wants to see in the lives of their children. We should be striving to instill these characteristics in our children as they grow and as they mature in life. If I can live to see my children fulfill these words of David to Solomon, I can die rejoicing. There is no greater joy than to know that one's children are living lives pleasing unto the Lord. His reign over the people was the second area that he spoke of. In verses 10 through 19, David gives Solomon the plans and the materials for the construction of the temple. He challenges Solomon to get to the job and to do the job correctly. Then David turns his attention to Solomon, the king. He speaks of the pressures. He speaks of the doubts that come along with the title of being king. And he reminds Solomon that no matter what the future holds, he can count on the Lord's presence, power, and promises to help him make it through. What a wonderful and blessed hope to instill in one's child. We must be careful that we do not fill our children's heads with our own doubts, fears, and prejudices. We must never teach them to worry or to fret over things that are in their life in that moment. They need to see us trusting. They need to see us trusting the Lord in faith. They need to know that God will never leave them, nor forsake them, as spoken of in Hebrews chapter 13. They need to know that God will guide their steps as spoken of in Psalm 37. They need to know that God will bring them safely through this life. You see, much of what our children know about God, they learn from us as their parents. And that places an awesome weight of responsibility on each of our shoulders. The third point that I will make today comes from chapter 29, verses 10 through 19. It was a time of reliance. In chapter 29, verses 2 through 9, David challenges the people of Israel to give to the work of the temple. 
They do so willingly. And when they do, David lifts his voice in a prayer of faith and thanksgiving and supplication. We want to look into this prayer for just a moment here right now. Here at the end of the road, David is still praising the Lord in verses 10 through 11. He still has a sweet and wonderful spirit. He is able to praise the Lord for his grace, his blessings, and his sovereign power as in verses 12 through 13. He is still amazed. Amazed at what the Lord has done for him through the years of his life. And he's still praying for others as well. David sets a great example for the rest of God's saints, even in this day in which we live. The end of life is not a time to let up on spiritual disciplines. It is not a time to stop praying. The end of life is best spent at the altar of prayer, seeking the Lord, praising the Lord, and calling on the Lord in the behalf of others. The end of life is a time to draw close, even closer to the Lord. Far too many people today have the attitude that they have what they have by their own power, by their own ability, and by their own efforts. They feel that their success in life came about by their own ability. So many people fail to see the necessity for learning, leaning solely on the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray the Lord will help me to reach the end of my way, rejoicing in his blessings, thankful for his grace, and leaning on his everlasting arms. I was headed for hell when he found me. He saved me by his grace, and he has blessed me in ways that defy all human understanding and belief. I never want to go to the place where I take credit for what I am and what I have achieved in life. I want to stay tender and I want to stay dependent upon the Lord himself. How about you today? How do you feel about credit where credit is due? The fourth point comes from verses 25, 20 through 25 of chapter 29. It was a time of rejoicing. David's life concludes not with sadness, but instead it concludes with rejoicing. He leads the congregation in offering worship and praise unto the Lord. They celebrate his life and they rejoice in their new king. David does not go out with a whimper. <laughs> he goes out with a bang. He leaves this life praising God. The end of life does not have to be a sad time, you see. It is possible to leave this life on a high note when it has been well lived before the Lord. As a pastor, I have stood by the bedside of precious saints as they were making the step from this life into eternity. And I can tell you, those that had a wonderful, loving relationship, a tried, true, and steadfast relationship with the Lord made that step in such a way that was an inspiration and an encouragement. 
And that's the way it should be for every born again believer. When you come to the end of the road, you should come even closer to the Lord. Still clinging to the Lord and still calling on the Lord. There is no reason for sadness in the passing from this life into glory, but instead there is reason to rejoice in our relationship and the place that Jesus has prepared for us for all of eternity. Oh, I know we always mourn a death because it takes someone that is close to us away from us. And that is right. In fact, that is proper. For they will truly be missed in our life. However, when we mourn, we do not do so for ourselves because we know that we will miss them here. But if they knew the Lord, we can rejoice because we know where they are. And we can know that they are doing far better than they have ever done in this life before. In this passage, it is the dying man who is rejoicing. David seems to have no fear regarding his impending death. He does not seem upset by the fact that his earthly journey is about to end. I have witnessed this kind of feeling and response in many people as they take that step. They look forward to seeing Jesus. He knows the Lord. David here knows the Lord. He knows where he is going. And that kind of knowledge gives David wonderful and blessed comfort. It always bothers me when I meet a person who is afraid of death. It makes me wonder where they stand with God. And I know in my own life there was a period of time where I truly feared death, but no more. The believer knows that God has promised to bring his children safely home at the end of their time here on this earth. The end of the road is not a time to dread. It is a time instead to prepare your heart and to rejoice because soon you will be with Jesus. Can you see the end drawing close? How are you going to meet that day, as all of us will do. Will you face it with dread? Will you face it fearfully? Or, like David, will you be able to rejoice in the day of your passing? Let me conclude this message With the death of David and an era when it came to an end, Israel's second king was her best and brightest king. But the lessons we learn from the life of David still speak to each of our lives in this moment and in this time today. As we consider the end of David's life, let us also consider the end of our own lives. How do we want to finish the race that we are now running? Like David, I want to finish strong and well. I want to end up remembering his blessing, carrying responsibilities, his relying on the Lord and rejoicing in the Lord. I want to finish like Paul, who said, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. 
I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. If there are areas in your life that need adjustment today, this is a good time to deal with them. Are there some broken dreams you would like to surrender to God today? Are there some responsibilities that you yourself need to fulfill? Are you relying on the Lord as you should? Are you rejoicing as the end of your mortal life draws closer? If the Lord has spoken to your heart today, please hear his voice. Come close to him. Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit and allow him to encourage you to strengthen you, and yes, even challenge you in some areas, but all for the purpose of letting you one day pass this life with dignity before the Lord as a testimony and as a witness to what God has done in and through your life. For others to see. Would you pray with me for this moment? Father, we come before the throne today in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus. Lord, we have looked at the life of David, we've looked at the victories, we've looked at some of the failures, but most of all, we have looked at the fact that. He was known to be someone truly seeking after your heart. And that is how his life ended on this earth. He ended rejoicing and praising you through it all. Father, today I would ask that you would speak to each of our lives, first of all, to those who are professed believers in you, that, Lord, we would take the time to examine our lives and let go of the things that we consider to have been failures and cling on to the victories that you have given us and show the world what it is to have a true, wonderful, eternal relationship with you. If there are those listening to this message today that do not know you as Lord and Savior, I would pray that in this moment, Father, you would speak to their hearts, you would draw them close to you, let them feel your love, let them feel the heart that you have for them, see the desires that they were created to fulfill, and commit themselves to you in this life so that they can rejoice in what it is to know you, to serve you, and to live for you, and to know that there is an eternity in heaven one day with you. Father, help us today, each one, to not dwell on what we consider to be failures, but help us today to instead focus on kingdom victories that you have blessed us with, yes, even challenged us with, but victories that bring you, Lord, glory and honor and help us to rejoice in each one of them. Lord, 
Today, we express our love to you. We give thanks to you. And our heart is a heart of desire to run this life well before you and to end it with dignity that will bring you glory and honor for all those who have known us. We receive this right now with faith, giving thanks in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining with us today for this message, for this series on the life of David. We at the Florence International Church are very excited about what God is doing in our lives and what in faith we believe he will do. And we want you to be a part of that as well. Join us on Wednesday mornings for our weekly devotional thought on Facebook at the Florence International Church. And then again next Sunday at the same time at www.florenceinternationalchurch.com. There you can find the message for that Sunday, and you can also look at the link that says watch previous services, and you can find the three past services there to view. If you miss something, or maybe you just want to take a moment and relive that message that God was speaking to your heart. We are truly blessed today. We are very thankful. Thankful to God and we're thankful to him for your life and your desire to live for him in all you say and in all you do. We look forward to seeing you again this coming Wednesday and next Sunday. We encourage you if you have prayer requests, needs, questions, you may email us at the Florence International Church at gmail.com and we will respond to you. We will pray for you and we will give thanks with you for God's victory in your life. May the Lord bless you powerfully today in a very special way. And may this Sunday be a Sunday that you will remember fondly rejoicing before the Lord for his love and his touch upon you. God bless you today in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus from the Florence International Church.